One where the top goes down So we can see the stars Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at IBM. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for panelists throughout the discussion. Please join us after the webinar for a guided meditation session with Casey Lane. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Frost and Sullivan, Greg Carisi. Thank you, Eddie. All right. Well, welcome to today's discussion on the evolving role of digital health passes, something that has been in the news and is uh, important technology to help us in terms of looking at reopening and staying open. You know, we've seen as COVID, we believe, or we hope is starting to wind down, that every time we think it's winding down, we see a resurgence somewhere in the world. Um, and we are trying to continue to address a number of variants that are out there. Not 100% sure every time that you know, we have things under control and then we see another hotspot pop up around the world. Obviously, we've all been impacted by uh, the pandemic over the last year plus. When we look at certain industries in particular, as well as our personal lives, you know, we don't see full stadiums in any uh, sporting venue. And obviously that's had a negative financial impact. Um, you know, our kids can't go to school, students can't go to university and really fill up the classrooms in the way they did before. Um, it, as well, we're looking at, you know, others, other venues in terms of entertainment and even businesses, factories and offices that, you know, we have yet to reopen. So, you know, there's a variety of um, issues that we continue to address in addition to the you know, what we've seen behind us in a way on the economic side and what we're looking at going forward, even as COVID, we believe, we're starting to wind down a little bit. Part of that is the reason for looking at how we can really push the envelope to um, be able to reopen and stay open. And with that, um, that's the framework from our discussion today. I'll introduce our panelists, um, give them a chance to introduce themselves. Let's start with Eric. Eric is um, part of the IBM team that's been working on their digital health credential solution. Um, Eric, I'll let you introduce yourself as a starting point. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Good to meet you guys. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, joining us today uh, on this panel. I think we have a lot of things to agree on, a lot of things to disagree on, which is awesome. And that's, that's, we're going to make it fun for you guys. Um, I, um, I lead what we call Emerging Business Networks for IBM Watson Health, which is really the creation of new business platforms with ecosystems. And Dakota and Glenn are part of our ecosystem, which is, which is really exciting. Uh, and we launched Digital Health Pass recently, uh, actually back in September now, uh, and we implemented the first large uh, public release of the product for the state of New York as Excelsior Pass. So it, it, excited to be here, looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. Um, Dakota Gruner is the executive director of ID2020. Dakota, why don't you give yourself or give us a quick introduction to your role in this discussion? Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for having me and you know, thanks to everyone who's joined. Um, I'm Dakota Gruner. I'm the executive director of ID2020, which is a public-private partnership focused on good digital ID or good digital credentials. And so predating the pandemic, we've been thinking about what defines a good credential, one that's privacy protecting, portable, gives individuals the ability to manage their own data. And very early on in the pandemic, recognize that the work that we've been doing on technical standards, on principles, and on you know sort of programs around the adoption and the and um, ensuring inclusivity and equity for uh, digital credentials were of direct relevance to this emerging and very important use case. And so we have been working um, you know, really since March of 2020 to ensure that you know digital health passes um, as they are rolled out. Um, are inclusive, they are equitable, um, they ensure protections for privacy and for civil liberties um, and are built on open standards. Um, that in the, you know, in the moment, the kind of the thrust of that work is around the Good Health Pass Collaborative, which is an effort that we have convened, um, brought together 120 organizations, I think actually much more than 120 at this point, but I'm, I'm quickly losing track um, to set standards for good health passes. Um, so very happy to talk about the work that we're doing there, including with IBM on um, 
on standards required for interoperability and for and for global recognition and trust. Great, thank you. Welcome. All right, and then we have Glenn Field. Glenn is the CEO of CLX Health. Glenn, you want to give us a quick background? Yeah, thank you, Greg and Eric and Dakota. Always nice to see you. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. CLX Health has a platform called Trust Assure, which is a trusted network for getting health uh, data to and, for, uh, to and from different stakeholders uh, with a focus on the privacy and the management of PHI for the end consumer. And that translates into a service that we provide to over 20 airlines and other industries, uh, healthcare industries, uh, office buildings, events, where a consumer can get their test done. We manage the whole process of getting the test ordered, getting the result back, protecting their PHI and providing a status that someone's either ready to get on a flight or ready to attend or ready to go to work. Great. All right. So we understand what the role each of our folks play in this ecosystem. Let's jump right into the discussion. Um, we'll start with just looking at and, and discussing a little bit about the role that health credentials are going to play in reopening communities and, and what we've seen so far. Eric, maybe we'll start with you. You mentioned New York State. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you know, New York is uh, utilizing health credentials to try to reopen and stay open. Yeah, I think when we started working with the state of New York uh, a few months ago, they looked at it as a mechanism to reactivate the economy uh, and recreate the trust uh, within the state of New York that people will be comfortable engaging with the rest of their community, with buildings, with airlines, with stadiums, and, and so on. So it was really um, to, to reopen. I, I, I don't say reopen the, act the economy, I think it's more reactivation and the creation of trust, which is very important, right? That notion of trust, I'm sure we're gonna talk about that uh, every every minute of this, of this session. Um, and then we, we looked at it very similar to what Dakota was saying earlier. We looked at it in five different dimensions. We said it has to be accessible. So we need to make sure that we give that to everybody, whether you have a phone or not, right? So we need a, a paper version of it. Uh, we need to be able to have credentials shared between different, um, members of the same family so they can have those credentials on their phone. Uh, so this notion of accessibility was very important. Uh, this notion of voluntary was also very important. We've seen uh, a lot of different discussions around this topic, but we are not forcing anyone to use a solution. Uh, the, same, the same way we are not forcing anyone to get vaccinated, we're not forcing anyone to use a solution. I think the idea was to provide options. So options in the context of New York was if I not comfortable uh, being vaccinated, I can go get tested and demonstrate my status with a test, right? So that's the optionality that we were offering, we are offering to the state residents. That was the second piece. So, uh, then we talk about privacy and security, obviously very, very critical. Uh, our platform, like every platform in this industry should uh, um, execute on, which is privacy protection, right? We need to make sure that we don't create a reason for people to doubt that their privacy is going to be impacted by using a platform like this. Super important, again, notion of trust, the trust that us as technology companies and as organizations, we are doing the right thing. So that notion of privacy and security. And I think the last piece was being open. Um, and being open means open by saying the credential that is created by the state of New York should be recognized over time outside of the state of New York. The New Yorker should be able to verify people with the Excelsior Pass, which is the pass we are talking about here, um, but also other passes coming from other places, right? So if I'm a small business in New York, I need to be able to verify people with the Excelsior Pass, but also people coming from Europe, coming to New York and you know want, want, wanting to enjoy a Broadway show and going to the restaurant, and they want to make sure that they can be um, verified as well. So this notion of open platform is very important. It's actually one of the most difficult things to execute on. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that with Dakota in particular, but it is, this is hard because you have, I don't know, 20 different platforms in the world today doing the same thing. And we are using slightly different standards. We need to bring that together and create those platforms. So privacy, security, openness, accessibility, voluntary, voluntary access, voluntary usage, and then openness where the key tenant of what we decided with the state of New York. And of course, access means everybody can use it, right? So there is no limitation in the state of New York. Everybody in the state of New York, 20 million people can use the solution today. 
Okay, interesting. And, um, you know, you mentioned this issue of different um, entities that might be building different systems. Um, you know, we have the airlines have, you know, one, uh, some of the airlines are putting, getting themselves together and, and coming up with a standard or a solution. You'll have businesses or stadiums that may come up with their own or work with different partners. How do we make it work together so that for a, an individual, you know, I'm not downloading five different apps to do the same thing. That, yeah. that really is exactly what sort of led to the creation of the Good Health Pass Collaborative. Um, you know, what we were seeing was a number of different efforts, um, some that were specific to a particular industry, um, you know, some that were developing individual solutions or working to develop standards, um, but where there was significant fragmentation between all of these different efforts. You know, I think Eric hit on something incredibly important in his um, opening comments there that I actually just want to quickly resurface, which was the importance of allowing for proof of vaccination or proof of testing. Um, you know, we think that from an equity perspective, it's absolutely vital that you know someone has the ability to elect to provide you know proof of test results and have those be seen as um, you know valid and and sort of equally useful um, as proof of vaccination, particularly when we take a global lens to all of this and you know with the recognition that there are many countries where. You know, the vaccine rollout could be many, many years. Um, and so when you, when you think about that, um, you know, there were efforts undergo, uh, uh, you know, underway, particularly the WHO Smart Vaccine Certificate Working Group focused on setting standards for proof of vaccination. Um, but we didn't see an analogous effort around proof of testing. Um, and we sort of didn't see a mechanism by which all of these many threads could be pulled together. Um, and so there was a real risk that, you know, the for the purposes of travel, there would be one sort of set of solutions um, and one set of standards, a different one within the European um, you know, Union and, and a whole host of um, you know, different efforts that led to, that would lead, I think, to a lot of confusion for not only the individuals, um, but for you know, the organizations who are trying to rely on these health passes in order to you know, reopen or to, to provide um, their services. And I, you know, an, an analogy that I think is quite apt here is, you know, thinking about it um, along the lines of credit cards, right? Um, you know, we all have confidence that when we show up at most places and we take a credit card out to pay, that that credit card, you know, will be recognized and trusted. And, you know, sometimes there might be occasional issues swiping it, but for the most part, um, you know, those credit cards work. And we don't particularly know why, um, but, you know, there has been lots of work done on standards in order to ensure that they work. Um, and what the situation I think we were, you know, sort of trending towards was one where effectively every credit card in your wallet was going to require its own point of sale terminal. So either people would be required to carry around, you know, an endless number of different credit cards, or more likely, they simply wouldn't. And you'd everyone would default to cash because very often you'd get to the grocery store and try and take your credit card out of your wallet to pay and it wouldn't be accepted. And so, you know, we were really concerned about that situation. And I think what, you know, the work that the Good Health Pass Collaborative and you know and so many others have been trying to do is to say how do we ensure that you know someone with you know relatively seamless um, interactions can pull their health pass out of their you know their digital wallet um, or pull you know sort of a paper based health pass out of their physical wallet share that and have the same confidence that that health pass will be recognized and trusted um, and that's really been the um, the work that we've undertaken in the last in the last couple of months. And, and Greg, if I could add to that on the, yeah, the fact of the trusted network and the relying, uh, creating a credential that can be trusted. This is the most important part of the aspect from our, our, our perspective. And that's why when we uh, create a request for an appointment for someone to get a test or a vaccination, we basically from a healthcare perspective have custody over that entire transaction from beginning to end. So it's 100% fidelity. Any test that's in our network is 100% verified and 100% certified. And that's all done electronically with the existing healthcare standards. And, and that's what we're doing. And it's so important with the work with IBM is getting that uh, digital connection into the digital health pass and Excelsior and other platforms so that you can trust that result. For those uh, that get transactions done outside of our direct global network, um, you can upload test results, for example, or vaccination results. And we have a 
army of trained clinicians uh, powered by a very advanced AI system that was used pre-COVID for a pre-adjudication of medical documents for claims. So these are highly trained people that understand what the structure, what the requirements are of a medical document should be and need to be. And then our system scores them and then provides that result back. So imagine fast forward after a year of using these type of platforms together and working together, where instead of having one registry for everything, we have a distributed registry that's in everybody's personal digital wallets where there's verifiable documents in there and people opt in and participate when they wanna share those credentials with other stakeholders. That's where this really ends up going and, and solving the problem. And it really comes down to returning operational efficiency to things like airlines, to event planners, to event sites, uh, office buildings, and return the convenience we had pre-COVID. Everything has changed uh, in the last 12, 14 months where before that we spent the last 20 years inventing technologies and new ways of doing things to create a level of convenience. We rolled back everything 20 years, going back to paper and dealing with this. And, and there's quite a bit of fraud too that's involved in, in these documents. And they have to be sorted out because unfortunately people will do what people will do. And we have case after case after case where we see in the, in the world where someone has fraudulent vaccination card or, or a, a fake a lab test and gets on a flight somewhere. And, the, and they get caught and they should, but that's where we are with it. And we have to get the trust back into the documents so that the health passes are certified. If I may jump in here, okay. I think, um, you know, one, one thing I'd love to pick up on in Glenn's comments is that, you know, in order to have that recognition and trust of a credential, you know, somebody presents their health pass and a verifier says, yep, we have full faith that you have been vaccinated or tested. There's actually a huge, there, there are multiple layers of interoperability that are required. Um, and I think it's important to kind of tease each of these out. I mean, the first is that you need standard data models and elements. So there needs to be, you know, there needs to be agreement on what information about a test or a vaccine needs to be captured and contained in that credential. Um, you, know, you can imagine, for example, that if you know everyone says we don't need to maintain the manufacturer of the test, um, and then it turns out down the line that you know there's a test manufacturer who everyone decides has been you know uh, falsifying their um, you know, their FDA submit submissions, for example, and um, you would you would have a hard time screening out those credentials that were based on, um, you know, sort of uh, you know, faulty tests um, if you didn't include that. So there has to be agreement first on what information about a vaccination or event or a test needs to be captured in, um, in a credential and how that needs to be captured. The second is the credential itself. Um, we need technically, you know, we need technically those credentials to be recognizable by a verifier. So you know, these are sort of very technical questions around the credential formats, how the credential is signed, um, the exchange protocols used, um, and we need to all kind of, you know, work together in order to, you know, to, to find a single approach to credential format signatures and exchange protocols that can be widely adopted. Um, the next is what we call a trust registry. Who is an eligible issuer of one of these credentials? You can imagine, you know, it's one thing if somebody, at least if we're talking about in the US, um, you know, comes forward and says, here's a credential issued to me by the Mayo Clinic. Um, most people say, okay, I've heard of the Mayo Clinic, but how do I know that the this was in fact issued by the Mayo Clinic? Um, and what happens when somebody says, look, I was tested, you know, by a highly reputable laboratory, you know, in my home country, um, but we've never heard of them because, you know, all of us don't walk around with kind of a perfect um, <laughs> registry of, you know, of, of test or vaccination providers in other countries. And so there's this question of sort of who are the, um, what are the different registries and who is an eligible issuer and potentially who is an eligible verifier. Um, so that's, you know, I think another important piece of this sort of interoperability challenges that need to be addressed. Then there's a question of identity binding. How do you know that the person who's presenting this credential was in fact the person who was tested or was vaccinated? Um, and this in some ways is one of the hardest problems um, I think to solve because you know, it speaks to business processes that are often well underway um, you know, and where it's very unlikely that we're gonna see sort of major changes in how you know, tests are administered or vaccines are administered. Um, and so we need to be thinking about how do we 
you know, have a, a high degree of assurance um, that the person who's presenting a credential is the person who should be presenting the credential. Um, the next piece is then how do you do the business logic around, you know, does this person meet the criteria for entry of a particular country um, or a particular venue? Um, and so here we're thinking about what's called rules engines, um, you know, how it is that you can run um, this against a series, you know, sort of a rules engine um, and have those, you know, have there be sort of simplicity and seamlessness in those processes. And then finally, governance. What happens, you know, how do you govern this whole ecosystem or ecosystems of ecosystems? And particularly, as Glenn said, when it's all being done in a very decentralized and distributed way, what are the rules that sort of you know, apply to those who are participating in the ecosystem such that we can ensure um, that, you know, uh, people are, are following the policies and that there's recourse if they don't. And so I think all of those are really important kind of categories of challenges that I just, I, I raised to show the complexity of the problem at hand. Dakota, thank you. I, you know, you hit on all the, the major key points. One of the benefits we have in the healthcare space, especially here in the United States, you know, we, uh, you're, one of the things you brought about is a concept called KYC, you know, know your customer. Banks have had to do it for, for decades. And healthcare, you need to do that as well. So we've partnered with TransUnion on our uh, identity. They're the gold standard we consider globally on uh, properly identifying who is connecting to the system. There's a second line of defense in, in our model when you uh, go to your appointment. You have to show your government ID to certify who you are. It's required. So we've got a second validation there. And again, since we have complete custody from a transaction standpoint of when the appointment was made, when the specimen was collected, when it was sent to the lab, when the lab processed it, when we got it back, um, we have 100% fidelity on solving those issues. In the cases where, and you're, you made a great point on the, um, the data modeling. Because, you know, pre-COVID, one of the reasons people look at us said, how did you build your network so fast? Well, we built a state-of-the-art data ops platform that allowed us to connect with any health provider at different levels. And let me tell you, it's 2021. We still get secure FTP. We get secure faxes. We have to send secure faxes uh, to, to participants. So we built a model where it's super clean internally on robust modern standards. And then we have what we call readers and writers that manage those disparate systems, but bring everything together into our uh, common model. And we do include all those things about manufacturers and everything else where, where the data is available. I want to stress one point. You mentioned if, if we had a bad actor, you don't even have to go that far. We have vaccines coming out of countries where they're advertised as 50% effective. So what do you do? with someone who's had that vaccine, they're still gonna need a test. And now we have testing. We have testing with a sensitivity, depending on the test type. We have some that are a, a coin toss, they're 50-50. And some you need to do a series. You need to take the same test two or three days to actually get, get a result. So we have to get some improvement in the sensitivity and the performance and fidelity uh, of this testing. As far as the destination rules go, I mean, we integrate with companies like Tomatic and, and we work with the airlines on those things, but we don't do it based on the, the walls of a country. I mean, we're creating rules for the buffet on a cruise ship. We're creating rules for this conference room on the third floor of this office building. So the, you're absolutely right. The rules engine is absolutely critical. And we take all of those feeds from different standards and bring them into our internal standard. We support all the other standards as well. But you know, when you're starting and, and forging new ground, a lot of those standards aren't either mature enough or in place yet for us to adopt, but we'll certainly adopt any and all that come down and we are. So I really appreciate your comments because it's super important. And interoperability, by the way, is the only way that we get the widespread adoption and use and get convenience return to every individual. So I think what's interesting to me is, um, I think that view that Dakota has is, is awesome because it gives you the different layers of things we need to think about. And then, and then you also need for each of them to think about the technology angle, the business angle, the compliance, regulatory policy governance, right? So you have the complexity of this is intense. If you're listening and you're listening to us right now, you're like, I will never get there. It's way too complex, right? So <laughs> I think one of the challenges that we all have as an industry is how do we, how do we create a, a simplified version of this and still have a user experience that is acceptable 
uh, and I think we all have different perspective on this, but I think at the end of the day, it's 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 really hard, right? I think that's one message. And then at the end of the day, I think we need to experiment because the only way to fix a very hard problem is to actually try and try and try. And at some point we're gonna get there. So I think we need to be patient with those technologies and those platforms, and we need to experiment together a lot. One of the things that I found really heartening in all of this, and to your point, I mean, we're trying to do something incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. You know, I think someone described this to me at one point as sort of this is the interoperability challenge of a, of a century. Um, you know, and we're trying to do it in the span of a, a couple months. Um, I, I'm very heartened by the fact that first, you know, we, we started with the Good Health Pass Collaborative publishing a principles paper. Um, and this was really an articulation of things that we felt were non-negotiable when, you know, implementing or developing a, a health pass solution that would be good. Um, and, you know, these are things like, you know, individuals should have the ability to control their own health data um, and the ability to, you know, choose when and where and with whom they want to share proof of their COVID status. Um, you know, that with that, you know, the ability to disclose only a portion of that data, what we call selective disclosure is incredibly important. Um, you know, that, you know, that we need to um, have confidence and, and legal protections to ensure that your data is then only being used for the purposes for which you've explicitly given consent, that it needs to be equitable, et cetera. And we published that paper um, February, very, very early in February with 25 signatory organizations. And within 48 hours, we were up to 60 organizations who'd said, absolutely, you know, we publicly commit to the principles established here. Um, you know, we now have 120 organizations, not only who committed to those principles, but who, um, you know, are actively contributing to the development of resultant standards. And so I think one of the really exciting things is, you know, when we, when we talk about, you know, sort of how we solve this really hard challenge um, in a, in, with remarkable haste. I mean, the first was by sort of starting with a set of principles, um, we've built critical mass around, you know, things that you know, we all think are non-negotiable. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I should note that, you know, of those 120 some odd organizations, we have all of the large health pass solution providers who are participating. Um, and, you know, when we think about what it's going to take to actually implement standards and, and ensure interoperability, you know, them all participating is, is really key. Um, the next thing, though, is that what we did was say, how do we run sort of the fastest, most open and transparent standard setting process that we could imagine? Um, and what we did was take all of those organizations and, you know, along each of the categories of interoperability challenges that I just mentioned, um, you know, create small drafting groups. And so we've had, um, you know, 120, I should say it's much more than 120 individuals because it's multiple representatives often from companies working around the clock um, for the last month. And just in the span of one month, we gave, you know, we said, you've got four weeks to come to a convergent perspective, um, get that down on paper. And so for each one of those, there's now a series of holistic standards and specifications that have been defined. Um, we're in the process of kind of, you know, everyone has now commented on one another's drafts. We're trying to ensure that there's consistency across the entirety of this interoperability blueprint, but we'll be putting that out for public review and comment um, in just 10 days on May 24th. And so I guess, you know, quick, um, you know, for those here on the call, we would invite your comments. Um, we want to know, you know, where you see issues or whatnot with what we're putting forward, but we've just, we've compressed this timeline into something very, very short. And, and Glenn, to your point, this, um, you know, I believe gives us the basis for organizations to say, great, we, we now have a sense of kind of what we need to um, adhere to and and it's you know it's a baseline set of standards and specifications and there's tons of room for organizations to go experiment I think particularly around things like um, user experience you know how you make this sort of simple and intuitive um, and uh, you know I think that that's going to be sort of the the strength of of how this you know has all come together. Dakota to that point I mean with IBM uh, we have an, uh, an effort underway now uh, with an airline and, an, and another provider that we're actually bringing together the digital health pass from IBM and common pass together uh, where they're flipping roles on verifier and issuer and it's really exciting to see how we're starting to to bring these things together because that that's how we bring scale and you're going to have as Eric has pointed uh, earlier on, you're going to have different geographic uh, standards or acceptance uh, of these things. So we have to work together. And this really is a global problem. If, if, if anything, 
hopefully COVID has taught the world that these things are now all global in nature and have to be dealt with in global in nature because COVID didn't start, for example, in the United States, it came across and now it's gone variants all over. And it doesn't matter if everyone were vaccinated here in the United States or in another country, you can still get infections. You can still have the cases come back. So it, it's absolutely critical that we get the interoperability down so that people can freely move around the world again. Let's yeah, talk a little choice. bit about that, what's underlying that interoperability or that ability of individuals, as was mentioned, to control data and who sees what, right? That's, that's um, a statement that we haven't really been able to develop or we haven't seen in the, um, the mass market solutions, at least, um, that we interact with in social media and other areas where, you know, a lot of our data is we could argue violate it, right? Um, so 100%. how do we how do we do it differently this time to create that trust that you know individuals will give consent and we don't have to move this data around as we you know try to support interoperability. So what's interesting, Greg, there's another advantage of, of past regulation and legislation around healthcare, and that is the 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 language around consent. So when anyone does get a test, they have to give consent. And the stakeholders have to be outlined very clearly. And there's a time, is it? It's, it's very clear. There's a time frame. Everything's involved there. And the person says, "Yes, I'm willing to do that." And they can revoke it at any time. The interesting twist of what's going on now is if you take like IBM's digital wallet, and we start putting this into the individual's wallet that they have control over, and you have a verifiable document in there, then there's complete transparency. They decide who gets to see it for how long, and, and people that don't have permission can't get to it. I would love to see a world where all of these health records are in these wallets and people can monetize their health data for themselves. I mean, this is where this can all go and, and create trust and privacy at a level that we've never seen before. Yeah, I think the transparency, it. yeah, Glenn, I, I completely agree. I think the transparency around that is important, but it's also a lot of education where yep. we need to educate everybody in the ecosystem to say, once the data is in your phone, it is your data and no one else has access to it except the, per the person who actually provides the test or the vaccine to you for obvious reasons, right? But uh, that, that edu education is gonna take some time. I think, I think that's really, really, really important. I think, you know, we, if, if we flip a little bit the discussion on, on this, I think we deliver a bunch of solutions, but we also have a responsibility as organization, as, you know, technology companies and healthcare companies, our responsibility is to push this notion of privacy and consent across the globe. Because what you just mentioned, Glenn, about consent is true in the US, but I'm Correct. pretty sure it's not true in some countries outside of the US about consent, right? So we need to have that, uh, we need to feel that responsibility and embody it, uh, all of us together to push that through, out, well, even outside of the US. What's nice, Eric, is if it's in the wallet, then the people have the final say. Yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I'm not going to let you access this. Uh, and I, we can't stress enough. The other thing is, I don't think stakeholder organizations should have access to people's specific health status, right? We need to turn this into the credentialing of I'm ready to do something. It's not that I'm, I have this disease or that disease or not. It has, mm -hmm. We we want to We want to move as rapidly away from that as we possibly can. And it's about I need to go do something. So there's a level of, 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 of compliance that I need to adhere to, to do that. And we want to get the convenience driven through the, the credentialing of the, of the yeah. past, but protect the privacy of every individual. There is no reason that information should be out there. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because when we talk to clients, including the state of New York, uh, the extension of what we are talking about here is credentialing of a lot of other things. And the analogy to the driver license is very obvious, right? Which is today when you, when you when you have a driver license and you want to demonstrate that you are over 21 to you know a restaurant, you expose a lot of information to that person instead of just saying yes, I am over 21, and that's all you need to know, right? That that example is a very resonates really well for us because uh, we expect every driver to have a driver license. That's an expectation that we all have. That's a regulation too, uh, but we also are sharing way more information than we should. 
So I want to pick up on the, the points that each of you just made, both around education and this kind of, you know, this selective disclosure point. So yeah. what we've done with Good Health Pass, and this was a really important kind of, I think, learning for our community over the last month or so, was really this distinction between what we're calling a credential and what we're calling a pass. Um, and a, you know, a credential is a certificate issued in a form that's designed to be, you know, easily kept on your phone in a digital wallet, for example, easily verified by a verifier um, that, you know, you have authenticity, you can believe the authenticity of it because you know who was the issuer. Whereas what we're saying is a pass is a credential to which, you know, you've minimized it down to only the minimum data required in a given transaction. So in some cases that may be nothing more than the yes, I'm over the legal drinking age, um, or yes, I meet the conditions of entry. Um, or it may be, you know, this business or this, you know, airline requires, you know, a bit more information. They need to know the date I was vaccinated. Um, but it's the idea being that the pass is that sort of minimal, um, that minimal state. And I think one of the really important things about that is that, you know, Eric, you were talking about the importance of education um, and having individuals, you know, understand kind of how to use their credentials or their passes um, as they navigate day-to-day -day life and understanding, you know, first the agency that they now have to disclose or not to disclose their own data. But the second thing is also understanding this idea of like what information is required of me and what should I, and this desire to then, you know, expose only the minimum amount necessary. One of the things that we see is, um, you know, there are credentials being issued um, that contain lots of information, right? They contain kind of the full suite of information about somebody being vaccinated or tested. And if someone doesn't know that they shouldn't share that whole thing to enter, you know, the bar, someone asks them for it, it's sitting in their digital wallet, it's a QR code, and they say, great, here's the QR code. And suddenly they're sharing a lot of unnecessary information with, um, you know, with a bar, for example. And so I think, you know, incumbent on us, and I think that is inclusive of policymakers, the technology community, you know, airlines, verifiers, we need to, you know, really kind of educate consumers on you, you don't want to share anything beyond what's necessary. Um, so I think that's the first piece, this distinction, this education around kind of, you know, share only the minimum required is, is really, really important piece of what we need to kind of communicate. The second is that we think it's really important that there are technical choices made that support selective disclosure, that would allow a person to basically on their phone say, I only want to share these three data elements and not the other six, That's and basically be able to generate a, dyna a dynamic pass that is only the, the appropriate information. Um, because if, you know, if they don't have the ability to do that, you know, you're sitting in front of your bar, you don't want to take a few extra minutes, um, you're going to go and share whatever you have. Um, and so they're important fine technical choices that you know, the community is wrestling with right now in order to ensure that selective disclosure is supported at a technical level. It's a really good point, Dakota. And, and you know, we all, if you've ever gone to another doctor and you had to have your medical records transferred, there's a whole consent <laughs> in the process. And there's a reason for doing that. And like you said, unless it's a, a, a medical office called an IV bar, there's no bar that's a covered entity that should be allowed to see your data. There's no gate agent for an airline that should be looking at your personal health data to get on a plane. I mean, we, we have to understand that there's regulations, laws, and, and, and rules, not only in the US, also all over the world with PHI that should be adhered to. And there's a lot of, um, they're being very lax right now on these regulations to allow the economy uh, to keep moving. But, but this is gonna come back to normalcy in regard to these regulations. They're gonna start enforcing this. So these type of capabilities are, gonna, are necessary. They have to happen. And I love the idea of the selective uh, uh, elements for the credential and minimizing the destination requirement. It's absolutely critical. And what are some of the technology elements that are needed to support something like that? I mean, is there a preferred technology pathway that enables that? Well, it really, you're talking about the, the domain models, being able to recognize the elements and, and map them through rules engines, Greg, to, to provide clarity on, on what you should do. So for example, with the airlines, uh, if, if, you're, if you go into the Trust Assure system on the, when we're integrated with an airline, 
all the destination requirements are there in front of you, but they're done with clarity, not to confuse you. In fact, your ability to select the appropriate location and the test is already done for you. We already know what you need to get into that destination and we'll only show you exactly what works for you. And then you just have to choose which is the most convenient location for you to schedule. And we can do that for the return trip. It's, it's an extension of that where Dakota is going, where now I, I'm at this the location or I'm at this border and I only need these seven pieces of data to get in. And that's all I wanna show. So we need to produce this credential dynamically to allow that uh, stakeholder to consume it and say thumbs up or thumbs down. Yeah, I, I think the other technology that maybe Greg you are alluding to is is this is this notion of um, how do we deliver trust, the trust of the issuer or the credential, the trust of the wallet of the verifier. And our, our answer to that question was was using blockchain technologies to demonstrate and be transparent about the identity identity of the different participants of the credentials themselves in some instances and the immutability of that information for us that was a, a very important piece of answering that that question around trust okay that's good to understand um just a reminder to our audience we're going to be jumping to q a soon so if you have any uh, questions you'd like to ask of our panelists feel free to put them into the chat we've got a couple but we'll continue to uh, review those and try to get to them here shortly. I just wanted to touch on one more thing in our discussion, which is it was hinted or mentioned that there are other uses of this type of uh, digital pass, digital wallet. Um, for example, driver's license you know, could be placed there. Um, what are some of the other utilizations of this type of technology or tool once it's out in um, the world that you know can it make it you know, maybe get an RO, higher ROI, make it more useful to governments or other issuers that will enable, you know, the technology investment to pay off beyond COVID. And, and I think on this one, uh, to, to me, the answer is, the first answer that comes to mind is, it's, it has to be beneficial to me as an individual. All right, so uh, the reason we started working on this is not because of COVID-19. We started working on this because we said, that in the next 20 years, people have the expectation to have better access to their own medical information and better control of who is, who is accessing this information. For two reasons, one, because it's me, it's my digital twin we are talking about here, right? We are not talking about uh, an abstract piece of information. We are talking about what makes me Eric, which is very unique. You know, if you, if you add genomics and all of that to the, to the picture. Uh, but the other dimension is we, we want to enable and empower individuals to be more engaged with their own health through data, through access to that information and get better care for themselves. And so I think at the end of the day, our mission here is to do this, is to activate that, 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 that view that individuals should be at the center. And then the, the edge cases of this is that, you know, providers will be able to share information is, you know, like Glenn mentioned, right? When I move from one, one doctor to another, I will be able to share information. I will be able to uh, import information from one, one location and share with a different type of organization. Uh, when, I, when, I became citizen, when I became a citizen of the US, I had to, be, uh, I had to demonstrate that I, I was vaccinated in France. Um, and, and when I showed my booklet with all the piece of paper in it with different signatures that doesn't mean anything to anyone, I had to be vaccinated again. <laughs> that was the only option I had, right? So we want to have that all those use cases to be to be a neighbor here. But at the end of the day, it is centered on the individual. I think to me that's very very important. So Greg, if I could give a couple of actual scenarios, because this actually for us was always a well wellness play. Uh, we happened to pick up the COVID case because of the timing of it and, and the necessity. But imagine uh, a world where you have access to all of your medical records, including non-medical records from non-medical devices, whether it's wearables or whatever, and combined into a, a personal dashboard where you're actually able to start mining the data within your own body, okay? This is the, the frontier that hasn't been tapped yet because, and if you had a chronic illness and you went into a restaurant, for example, and we could give you guidance on your top three choices, that exact moment, on what you should choose. You could choose whatever you want. 
And when you leave 30 minutes after your meal, we'll show you the result of your choice, right? This drives compliance. This will enable people to make better personal choices and private choices without having you know everybody involved. Another case would be you're gonna go for uh, surgery the next day. Well, the night before the physician or the surgeon has to look through your medical records to look at indicators and complicators to determine what is going to be your recovery process. What are the right steroids? What are the right things you should use? Imagine you being able to share this information to that surgeon where a three hour review that's based on paper and some digital records to a 10 minute review where they have a dashboard that shows them everything they need to know about you and you're adjudicating the claim stuff so that your claims get paid faster. So there's a lot of really powerful things that can come out of this. And the whole secret has been moving this out into the hands of the individuals, empowering them, letting them control their data, get benefit out of their data, and then let the result of all of that be shared with the other stakeholders. I mean, I, I, picking up on that, you know, I think both Glenn and Eric have been talking about use cases within healthcare. And certainly this, you know, the necessity of continuity of care is one that you know, I think all of us have struggled at some point trying to share medical records between one provider and another and literally having, you know, signing off on faxes. Um, and so that's one that I think is top of mind for many of us. But there are, of course, use cases beyond the healthcare ecosystem as well. Um, you know, one of the ones that we've been particularly interested in is sort of educational credentialing. Um, you know, at the moment you think about people who have gone to various vocational training programs, they've, you know, graduated from undergrad, et cetera. You know, we rely on, you know, oftentimes pointing an employer back to an institution we attended decades ago for a reference check um, if they're asking for it. But if you had a way of being able to verify, I did in fact go to this university or I, you know, graduated from this program, um, you know, that could be incredibly important for, you know, demonstrating your, um, you know, the skills that you would bring to a, to a new employer. You think about it even in the context of LinkedIn. Um, you know, at the moment, we kind of have to take at face value most of what people have put in their LinkedIn profile. You could imagine that being, um, you know, more easily validated um, and people being able to say this is, in fact, um, you know, a, a credential or a you know, certificate that I've received. Um, there are use cases in financial services. Um, you know, you, Glenn, talked about KYC Thanks. earlier on in this call. Um, you know, it's incredibly costly um, for financial institutions to meet the know your customer and anti-money laundering regulations that they're subject to. And those are regulations that are very stringent for a very good reason. Um, but if you have better models of digital credentials that make it easier for someone to share, you know, who they are, important attributes about themselves, um, do so in a digital manner um, and have the authenticity of those credentials be, um, you know, easily, easily um, asserted, um, you know, that could bring down costs um, for sort of adherence to KYC and AML requirements considerably and would, um, you know, have material, uh, you know, benefits for, uh, you know, for everyone who was trying to kind of participate in an ecosystem. So um, there are lots of use cases well beyond, um, you know, the healthcare ecosystem. I think one of the things that we are quite sensitive to is that, I, you know, the, the problem at hand is one that does have a temporal horizon. Um, you know, we hope um, that at some point we're no longer in an international pandemic, um, you know, that we are not using health passes, um, you know, to, to participate in sort of day-to-day -day life. And so one of the things that we've been advocating for, you know, very strongly with governments around the world has been, you know, the necessity of making sure that we are implementing technical infrastructure that has all of the protections that we think are important, um, you know, and where if the technological infrastructure is carried forward and used for other use cases, um, that's a, you know, we, we, we've built in all of those protections, but also recognizing the purpose limitation of the work that we're doing right now. Um, and you know, I think I saw a question in the chat around what happens if this leads to just sort of changing cultural norms about what it might be okay to ask of someone. And here, you know, this is a really a policy question. And so we're, we've been working with governments to say, how do you um, regulate where, you know, and who can ask for a health pass? Um, you know, maybe it's important to, you know, to, to set limitations on who can be a verifier um, or what information a verifier of a particular type can request. Um, and so that's, you know, I think a really important kind of policy safeguard that needs to be put in place around the use of health passes. 
Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add, Dakota, you know, that COVID has brought it really into focus, but this isn't new. I mean, we've been dealing destinations and countries will always have destination requirements. Uh, you know, you some of you may remember, but in my younger days, we used to have to carry around a yellow card that said we had this vaccine or that vaccine, and you had to have your paper document with you to, to get into places. And we have it, it's a requirement to get into schools and to attend public schools here in the United States. So these requirements are, are not really new, they're, they're amplified the case. And when you talk with the CDC and John Hopkins and other experts, uh, you know, COVID will go take its path like every pandemic does, but the next wave is gonna be the flu coming in, the new influenza break that's gonna hit after this is gonna be quite substantial and people need to be prepared for that. I also look at it and say, what if we had all this in place before COVID? What would have the differences been for cruise lines, for events, if all of this infrastructure and interoperability were already in place, we would have had a much better time of it than we did. And that's another reason to drive this and get it into place because it, you know, hope is important, but it's not a strategy when it comes to this. We need to have these things in place because it isn't going to be about if, it's definitely when and how often. So a couple of questions that have come up on the screen from the audience um, are around, you know, how do you bring in third party apps or others into this ecosystem and what role would they have in either sharing information or utilizing information, um, you know, whether that's, that's an airline app or uh, something else. That's, yeah. that's, that's exactly what Dakota is talking about. Mm-hmm. The interoperability and the standards, the standards are, are what are going to drive this. And then the adoption will be based on use case. What is the value? Is it necessary? Is it needed? Do people want it? And I think that's the last part, Erica, that I love about some of the comments that you've been making. The people are going to decide on how much this is used and where it's used and how well it's used. The governments will set their policy and regulations and standards and destination requirements, but it ultimately will be the people on how many decide to participate or not. Yeah, and I think very tactically, maybe Greg, to answer the question, um, uh, all of us do commit, you know, to some extent to have our architecture, our SDKs, our APIs open to the rest of the ecosystem for everybody to build on the top of. Right, we we have an IBM Digital Health Pass application that you can download today, but that's not the main use of the platform that we have. The main use of the platform is through applications developed for or with our clients, and they use the technology because they decided to build their own version of the solution or integrate the verification service into their own engine that already exists. So the openness of the of the platform is is standards, yes, but also commitment to to give access to the platform, which is why my point earlier on access is very important. And there's a question that's tied to that around, you know, it's a complex issue. Obviously we've been talking about standards and ways to, you know, try to make it interoperable. But the question here is what could go wrong as we put this in place and how can we avoid those risks? Well, there's always policy, technical or anything else. There'll always be a bad actor, Greg, right? There'll always be a bad actor. And we, you know, we, one of the things that Dakota mentioned earlier, which I think is super important and we really didn't drive into it. It's this concept of accountability. And that applies to every stakeholder or constituent involved in this system. You know, we have a world right now where people can fake everything and they can try to get away with everything. But once you're in uh, platforms like this, where you're actually known your identity, you can maintain your privacy, but you can't escape accountability. And that's gonna be a two-way street, which is actually what's needed to to clear a lot of things up. If you even look at in social media, imagine where you could have your privacy in your social media, but you couldn't get away with saying things you shouldn't be saying. Uh, you know, not about, it's not about limiting free speech or anything like that. It's about if you say something, everyone's going to know you said it and there's nothing wrong with that. So I think yeah, that's I, how this gets resolved. This is a two way street because accountability, all the labs in our platform are certified, all the customers using it. We know who they are. It, it's really important that that trust network is built and the, the integrity around that network is maintained. Yeah, and I think that's that's a little bit what's unique about where we are now. Um, and what's unique is 
we are responsible for this individually as organizations, but we are responsible for this together too, right? And we cannot say, me as a technology company, I'm going to do the right thing and, and, and you guys are going to take care of the rest, right? We have to engage Absolutely. with policymakers, with governments, with the, which is why what Dakota is doing with Good Health Pass is so critical because I, I cannot say, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you the technology, you guys take care of the rest. That, that's not what we should do. But we, that's over. This game is over. This it was 20 years ago, right? That's, that was social media at the beginning. That's it. We can't do that anymore. I, I mean, I'd, I'd answer this question um, with perhaps actually one of the questions that I see in the Q&A, um, which is that I think a partial answer to how we do this and how, you know, exactly as Eric described, we do this collectively um, is through the development of trust frameworks or governance frameworks. Um, you know, that that's absolutely vital in order to ensure that there is accountability for all of the actors who are participating in this, this digital trust ecosystem. Um, so that's, that is one important piece. The other piece is policy, right? Um, you know, there need to be regulations put in place. Um, and so we need the participation of not just the technology community. And I think it's remarkable that we've gotten so much of the technical community kind of coalesced around these principles, but we need policymakers, um, you know, to be, um, uh, you know, participating in this and we need the public, um, you know, we need the public asking for that accountability, um, both of, you know, their governments of the issuers of the verifiers. Great. So we're pretty much at the end. We've got maybe time for one minute each. If you were to say, hey, this is the area that we'd like some of the people in the audience to focus on helping resolve to move this forward. What would you ask of the audience to say, hey, get involved and do X to help get this to the end point we're all seeking? My, right, maybe I'll let you start first. Okay, okay Glenn, go ahead. No, no it's problem. all yours. I, I think people should really strive to get real answers to their questions and they should be demanding about it. There is a lot of misinformation out there going around. I think it's super important that everyone, you know, step up to take the responsibility of, of learning for themselves and, and finding the right information and doing your research. Um, you know, there's a question I saw out on the, the Q and A real quick where someone asked, well, if, so, if I'm vaccinated, why do I need to take a test to get on a flight? And the question is, it isn't about why you need to take a test. It's about the destination first setting the requirement, but two, do you wanna be on a flight with a passenger that's had a vaccination that's less effective than yours? Or there's a new variant in place. So testing is always gonna be there. And it's important because it's the one way we can get to an absolute answer on a particular uh, person status. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit like saying, uh, I have a driver license from, from the US so I can drive in China. No, you can't, right? That's a little bit of this, of this notion. Um, uh, but um, I, I think the, the one thing I would say is help us educate the market, help us educate individuals, policymakers, government, uh, technology ecosystems, and, and help us build the ecosystem, right? There's a lot of things that we are still discovering. The medical science is moving, the political environment is moving. So help us build this ecosystem so we can do it together better. I think that's the, the key message to me. This is a collective effort, um, and you know we need participation with sleeves rolled up in, you know the the sort of the hard work of um, setting standards and, and interoperability and and this sort of educational piece. So two very sort of tactical asks, I guess. The first is again, um, you know we we're putting this out for public review and comment in about ten days. It'll be on the Good Health Pass website. Um, please, you know, do go there, um, weigh in. We want to know what you think. And the second is. Exactly as Eric said, you know, talk to the people in your community, the people in your networks. Um, you know, we need to educate people that there is a, an approach to health passes that can be incredibly privacy preserving, that can give individuals agency over their data and start to correct some of this misinformation that, um, you know, I think has kind of taken over some of the, the narrative. And, and Greg, if I could add any questions that haven't been addressed, if people want to send them in or get them to us, we're happy to, to respond. I know there's a question on the home testing. There is some amazing technology that's just around the corner that's going to revolutionize that. So there is a lot of hope there. And I saw a question on the interoperability and efficiency for healthcare workers. Uh, people, I mean, 
healthcare workers, they're heroes and everybody should embrace healthcare workers. What they go through and how they have to work is uh, unbelievably challenging. And, and the interoperability or lack of interoperability so far in the healthcare sector is very, um, very stressing and traumatic actually for the healthcare workers. It, just find an ER doctor, if you can ever meet one and ask them what it's like <laughs> dealing with the three different systems that they get logged out of every 30 seconds while they have to answer a phone call. I mean, it, it, it's a huge challenge and hopefully we're gonna be breaking those walls down here. Yeah, it looks like we're moving in the direction that HHS has tried to push that you know people can control and access more of their own health records and, and keep it themselves. So this is a technology that helps to take that step forward, it would appear. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, it's been a great discussion, very insightful. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Eddie um, for some meditation post that discussion. Um, and we'll try to bring down the complexity a little bit in the world that we live in and, and take a deep breath. Eddie? Thank you to Greg and to all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now take a break from your day with a meditation session with Casey Lane. Hi, could someone whose video is still on just give a thumbs up that you can hear me okay? Oh, everyone's video is off. All right, I'll assume you can hear me just fine. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric, Greg, Dakota, thank you. Uh, thank you, it's always so uh, fascinating to listen in. I get to listen on the last 10 minutes or so and I wish I could have been there for the full discussion. Um, my name is Casey Lane and I'm here, yes, to uh, ground down after what sounds like an incredibly stimulating uh, conversation. And I offer up, if you have about 15 minutes to stay, really incredible benefits that come from taking a moment to center your body. So I will guide through um, the majority of the meditation, there will be a moment near the end where for about one to two minutes, I will um, be silent, but I will guide you to that point. So take a moment to roll out your shoulders. You might take a few gentle head tilts, allowing your ear to drop toward one shoulder and then switching sides. Feel free to find a comfortable position on your seat in your chair, or if it is accessible in the space that you're in to even lie down or maybe take a seat somewhere else, you are more than welcome to find a position that will really help you to center and recognize the arrival in this space now of um, really nurturing your body through breath and visualization. So if you'd like, you might gently close your eyes allowing almost a heavy sensation across your eyelids, or you're more than welcome to gaze at the tip of your nose or something slightly out in front of you. And you might notice that especially as you still your physical body and close your eyes, the mind continues to chatter on. And this is extremely normal and part of meditation. So the goal is to not eliminate our thoughts, but rather to almost step back and be the observer of them, notice as they wander and invite our focus back to the breath. So start by placing your palms face down on your thighs and whether your eyes are closed or gazing out in front of you, can you start to draw your focus inward. So if your eyes are open, really honing in on one thing to look at. If your eyes are closed, thinking of this as like the curtain that is shutting out all of the stimulus from the outside world and giving you permission to go inward. Start by taking a really long cleansing breath in through your nose and big sigh out. Two more like that, full long breath in, feel your belly and chest expand, hold your breath at the top, big sigh out your mouth. <sighs> you might even make sound with your exhale. One more, breathe in, fill up. And sigh out. 
And now allow your breath to exist and ebb and flow without any sense of controlling it. Kind of like an oceanic wave ebbing to shore and then back into the body of water. Let your breath do the same. And start to notice where your feet are. Draw your attention to your toes. Could you even spread them out slightly, maybe wiggle them? And then feel them settle into stillness as you draw your focus toward all four corners of your feet connected and grounded to what's beneath you. Start to send your focus now up your shins and your calves without even changing anything, just notice your knees. Notice your thighs. Notice the feeling of your hands resting on your thighs. Notice where you are being held by either your chair or the ground. Notice your sits bones and see if you can Surrender physically even more into the support of your chair. Notice your belly, see if there's any tightening or holding. Could you soften? And even within that heaviness, that total release that you've now established through your legs, allowing your muscles, your hips to soften. Can you still remain tall through your spine? Can you notice your right pinky finger, your right ring finger, your right middle finger, your right pointer finger, your right thumb, all the while still noticing your breath. Left pinky finger, left ring finger, left middle finger, left pointer finger, and left thumb. Notice your right arm, your left arm, and then notice all the way toward your heart space. bringing to mind, and it can be something simple, but something or someone that invites joy into your life. It could be your favorite song, your favorite color, a person you love, something that makes you laugh, something you feel grateful for, let that thought be present of something that sparks a feeling of gratitude or joy. And can you almost feel as if that emotion of joy is now spreading through your heart space? Almost a warm sensation or maybe the feeling of light, it might show up as a color. And let that move from your heart all the way up your neck. And notice that even while you are rooted and you are grounded and you are connected, you're sitting nice and tall. Or if you're lying down, you notice length in your spine, space between your earlobes and your shoulders. And that feeling of joy, that idea, even if you don't feel it, that thought of gratitude continues to move up toward your lips, the place that you speak from, around your cheeks, your eyes, all the way to the back of your skull and up the crown of your head. Notice the sensation of being held. You are grounded and connected. 
and notice the sensation of being present and energized. Spine is long, shoulders slightly down and away from your ears. And from this space of groundedness, from this space of connectedness, even if the mind is wandering, can you recognize that you have oriented yourself in space by drawing awareness to your physical body? Now from here, exhale completely emptying your lungs. And breathe in on a count of six, five, four, three, two, one. Hold your breath at the top and exhale on a count of six, five, four, three, two, one. Good, this time inhaling for four, fill up your lungs, three. Sit nice and tall, two, one. Hold at the top, exhale, six, five, four, Three, two, one. Inhale, four, three, two, one. Slight hold and exhale, six, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale, four, three, two, one. Slight hold, exhale, six, five, four, three, two, one, inhale, four, three, two, one, slight hold, exhale, six, five, four, three, two, one, inhale through the nose, four, four, three, two, one, hold out the mouth, exhale, six, five, four, three, two, one, once more. Inhale through the nose, four, three, two, one, slight hold out your mouth, exhale, six, five, four, three, two, one. Continue this on your own. You're welcome to change up the counts and breathe longer or shorter. Or if the counting breath isn't resonating, go back to just noticing your breath. And if the counting is helpful, you stick with that. Or if the thought of something that sparks gratitude is helpful, imagine that you're breathing that energy in through the form of breath. And I'll leave you here like this just for one minute to explore and navigate the experience of focusing on your breath. If the mind wanders, it's cool, no worries, it happens. Our brains are wildly complex and designed to think, but practice coming back to the count or back to the feeling of gratitude. I will guide you back in one minute. Wherever you are, gently exhale your breath. <sighs> Inhale, I am. Exhale right here. Our breath anchors us into what is actually happening in any given moment. So 
with much appreciation to yourself for setting aside time to practice presence, to practice groundedness. You might draw one hand to your belly, one hand to your heart. And know that you can keep that inhale, I am. Exhale right here with you throughout your day. And I so appreciate it. Take your time blinking your eyes open. You might look around at the physical space you're in, notice the colors you see, take a moment before you come back to looking at the screen. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day and many thanks to the health team and I will see you next time.